So today on the Keelan Yoga Podcast, we have Dr. Christopher Wallace, eminent uh, academic uh, scholar, uh, philosopher, and uh, non-academic practitioner and scholar. So what does that stand for, Christopher? Let's uh, unpack that first of all. Oh, (laughs) yeah, I guess it just means um, I publish uh, in academic peer-reviewed journals and books and also non-academically uh, and I teach in non-academic contexts uh, and sometimes invited to give lectures in academic settings so I'm just managing to bridge both worlds um, I was on track to be a university professor and I decided uh, I much prefer to teach practitioners uh, in the mm. modern yoga scene, especially, um, and just enjoy the freedom that that affords, uh, not being in the uh, academic box and tied to a specific department at a specific university. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of what's been going on for a number of years now. Hmm. I mean, I mentioned that because I think your your work is very um very precise, very good. Um, very well researched and also you know it's very clear that you're a practitioner as well so you're really one of my favorite people someone who's a scholar and a practitioner and there's a few um Jim Mallinson who comes on the podcast quite a lot being another one um I, I know we said that we might cover this at the end but would you give a five uh, you have an interesting background would you mind just going through how you got into the whole thing in the first place briefly you know, just to introduce you to the listenership a little bit yeah so you know, my parents were into alternative spirituality, especially of of Hindu varieties, though they wouldn't have used that word, uh, <laughs> Indian Eastern spirituality and philosophy. And so, you know, for example, my, my father took me to Rajneesh Puram in the 70s, uh, you know, as just a tiny little kid. And before that all blew up, right? And uh, he mm. took me to meet Swami Muktananda uh, in, in California, and uh, and that that's the tradition that um, my mother ended up practicing practicing quite intensively and seriously, which is uh, Siddha Yoga, um, and, and so with that lineage particularly. So I was exposed to it a lot. You know, I was hearing Sanskrit mantras from from a young age. uh, And then, you know, around about 12 or or 13, I rejected it all as one does (laughs) reject whatever one's parents are into, you know. And uh, then some years later at 16, I, I, I got slightly interested again. And attended a uh, a meditation intensive a one day uh, meditation intensive and had um, a powerful experience which was sort of like an initial awakening um, just at the end of it uh, not expecting it it certainly wasn't priming because I was mostly opposed <laughs> to everything I was hearing and yet by the end there was this um, sort of kaboom, a, a gentle kaboom, right, the, that uh, opened me up and, and to, to a wider, broader, deeper kind of experience than I knew was possible. And um, so that was a, a crucial turning point. And so then I, I started um, in as a practitioner and, you know, had this sort of weird double life that people who practiced at a young age can probably understand where on the on the one hand i was like the uh like the altar boy at my local meditation center and going to all the you know uh, the events and everything and uh, even there at like 5 a.m on on some days or whatever and then also you know exploring psychedelics and out late at night with friends and uh, you know falling in love and you know exploring mm-hmm. the body and sexuality and like so it felt like a double life <laughs> a bit for a while um especially cuz you know the the meditation scene that I was involved in Siddha yoga was uh, and was and is very conservative 
Um, so so it, it, it encouraged that that split. Um, so in a way, many years later, when I discovered um, the deeper teachings of of classical tantra, um, which were quoted in in Siddha Yoga, but never explored in depth. Uh, right. But when I when I looked deeper into those teachings, it, it, it provided a way to um, understand the the holism of this kind of spiritual seeking, meaning to say someone who's meditating on the one hand, but also doing psychedelics on the streets at night and, and, and exploring sexuality and all this stuff, that this is actually part of a single project that you don't even realize that that intuitively you're you're seeking um the deeper meaning uh or if there is one <laughs> to to reality as a whole and that that deeper meaning must be inclusive of all aspects of ourselves you know um mm -hmm. so not just the higher transcendental instincts but also the sensual uh, and so on and so in retrospect you know I, I was seeking in various ways, um, but you know, only non-dual tantra provided a context to understand it in that way. That 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 spirituality doesn't need to exclude sensuality and sexuality and uh, you know whatever else. You know, even though it also provides a context for a kind of of, of discipline <laughs> rather than rather than hedonism, right? because that's required to to make those explorations uh productive and meaningful right rather than just attachment to peak experiences so um you know in fact i've never i've never talked about it in in, in quite that way but <laughs> there's a reason that as i delved deeper into non-dual tantra which became my specialty non-dual classical tantra um that it always resonated with me, even when it contradicted or conflicted with the teachings that I had grown up with. You know, mm. so there's sometimes we we have this experience. We find a, a version of the spiritual path that speaks to us so deeply that we it, we feel an internal yes, even when it's contradicting something we were raised with, uh, which you would think would be stronger. Um, but there's this there's this deeper knowing that wants to be met <laughs> by a spiritual path, and that's what what happened in my case. So I, I gravitated over time, over years, really, um, to the teachings of uh, non-dual classical mm -hmm. Shaiva Tantra <laughs> to to g keep giving a fuller name to it. I don't I don't know whether I've ever heard what kind of lineage or teachers you you studied with. Yeah, well, a, a variety, you know, hmm. um, Paul Muller Ortega, uh, who's who's still out there teaching this this same sort of thing, though in a different hmm. way, um, and uh, a, a couple of other teachers who, uh, well, one who's not a public figure, one who i prefer not to name uh but then i also found teachers that happened to be very much in accord with uh non-dual tantra uh like adya shanti so mm. Mm. Yeah, so, like him. Yeah. yeah his and his teaching mm. is is very much in accordance with uh, non-dual tantra in various ways though it doesn't cover all the same ground needless to say um, but I, I, I felt this and I even corroborated this feeling by giving him a copy of Tantra Illuminated, which he read, he told me cover to cover, and he agreed that his experience of, of the nature of reality and awakening and consciousness, um, really tallied as it were with this, uh, teaching that he'd never even heard of. He'd never read about classical tantra's version of of non-duality um, mm. which is different right from from vedanta and and from other versions so so yeah so he was a teacher and a mentor and, and eventually uh, something of a friend um and and 
he helped me actually uh, unpack the the transmissions that I'd already received because my my first teacher, my root guru, um, she she gave me so much, but in a non intellectual way, in a more energetic uh, way, a direct transmission in person, you know, really powerful, powerful. Um, transmissions that I can't, you know, even begin to explain in words, but it felt like other teachers like Paul Muller and Adyashanti and others were needed to sort of un un unpack those um, transmissions that I'd already re received and uh, help me integrate them more fully, understand mm. them more fully, as well as further transmissions that occurred with, with Adya and also with the... Um, with the, the, the past masters, as it were. So uh, in this tradition that, that I study and practice, you know, it, the, the idea, one of the ideas is you can also receive transmissions from those uh, ancient masters who are not here in the body, but who are still living forces. Right. Uh, That's a know. bit Madame Blavatsky, isn't it? Yeah. Well... <laughs> Letters Except, from the ceiling. No, <laughs> because there's no claim. Like she yeah, did, yeah. claimed, oh, I've got them. I've got the message word for word from the ascended masters, right? And what I'm talking about is is more like, um, you know, when I study the words of Abhinavagupta, who lived mm. a thousand years ago, that they come alive in this vibrant way. That's that's mm. again inexplicable unless you've had the experience. Um, so not that Abhinavagupta speaks to me, you know, and I've got <laughs> a direct line uh, for new teachings from him, but rather that his energy is is alive in his words for me in a way it's not for someone else. Someone else could read the, the, his words in, in, in Sanskrit or in translation and, and get nothing and feel, uh, what's this guy talking about? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You know, so that's what I'm referring to there. I'm going to ask you because I don't know whether I'll get another chance to chat to you. Sure, Did sure, you ever um, meet Tony Parsons? Tony Parsons in London. Um, I used to go and see him a lot. And um, I know you no. go to London sometimes. So No, um, no. Oh, you I should go and see him. He's in um, Hampstead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting guy. I'd like to see a conversation between you two. It'd be interesting. Cool. Um, yeah. Um, anyway. Um, what about Tantra then? Like, um, I think some people are going to have misconceptions about Tantra. You mentioned in some of your videos the difference between Neo Tantra and Classical Tantra. Uh, you know, for people that don't have any idea about Tantra, and it sounds, you know, like, obviously it sounds rather alluring, right? Oh, you get to do whatever you want and you get the meditation as well and you get to have sex and drink and do whatever you want, you know, like. <laughs> so, you know, what exactly, what, do you, is it true? You know, is it the best of all worlds or, uh, you know, is it a little bit more tricky than that? You know? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. It is it's the I think it's the best of all worlds, but if you do not engage the practices and all your behaviors with great discernment, then you don't get to experience what the, they're talking about, what the tradition is talking about. You don't get to actualize the goal, you know. So if if it's a pretext for just doing whatever you like, then it's not a spiritual path at all. It's just a hobby <laughs> or, or something that you, you know, uh, show off <laughs> right to others like, oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a tantrika or whatever. And that means uh, anything goes because it's all God. So we would say that the people who represent the <laughs> classical tantric path, that um, that's not engaging the path at all, right? Because there's, there's this incredible, incredible discernment that's cultivated and required um but yes it is also true that it's not a religion and it's it's a spiritual path it's it's a way of engaging spirituality uh that is all inclusive that excludes nothing that doesn't have um some kind of moral code that applies to everyone and yet you are required to cultivate great discernment about what is beneficial and what is non-beneficial uh, in any given circumstance. And the reason there's no Ten Commandments or moral code is precisely because mm -hmm. what's beneficial in one circumstance is not in another. And what's, uh, you know, what's non-beneficial in one context is, is beneficial in some other. So the, the sensitivity to context 
is what makes um, Tantra different in a way. It not, it's not saying um, that, that all actions are equal. Or any, it's, it's, so people get confused about the <laughs> meaning of the word non-duality. Mm -hmm. like oh, there's no good and bad, so everything's equal, so it doesn't matter what you do. That's not at all the teaching. It's that um, actions can be extremely beneficial or extremely harmful in a given context and then when the context changes that that changes the the, the nature of the impact of the action and so uh, it, it's a path that requires a lot more carefulness consideration and thought uh because if you've got a religion that just says do this don't do that in all contexts period then it, it it closes down it closes down thinking it closes down sensitivity mm -hmm. you're just supposed to do what you're told mm -hmm. and the context doesn't matter so this is mm -hmm. very very different in that sense um it seems to, yeah i say it seems to demand a lot more individual responsibility and also you'd think then that without a kind of general kind of moral or, or, or teaching yeah included in a book form for example you'd need a particular relationship with an individual. Like it, the, the, it, it prioritizes a particular relationship with a guru or, or master who can kind of help you differentiate, you know, because it's, it's, it's very murky water. And, and, and as you well know, and there are many people, tantric, um, famous tantric practitioners, Chogyam Trumpa or, you know, the like who, who seem to go off the rails a bit. It seems to be a little bit volatile and uh, you can take a, a, a wrong turn fairly easily, get yourself in a lot of trouble. Yes, yes. The idea being there that um, somebody who's not uh, complete in their process, um, who has a very high attainment, as as people call it, right, they can still mm. end up going off the rails. And, and, and Trunk was an example. Now, Depends who you ask, of course. If you ask <laughs> disciples mm. of Trump, he never <laughs> went off the rails. It was all just a, a play. It was a personality display. He pretended to be uh, an alcoholic and a drunkard, um, but it's but it's well, but it's hard to hold that line when you know he 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 died at, in a mess from alcoholism, right? But uh, certainly, we can't deny the power of the teachings that he gave. Um, some years before that, you know, um, though, though, and to my mind, they're not always the most coherent teachings, even at his peak. So I would, I would side with those who say, oh, this is a brilliant advanced practitioner who wasn't complete in his process of integration and, and, and whose um, co compulsive tendency got the better of him uh, before he could complete his process, right? So, um, I would not say, <laughs> oh, look, here's an example of somebody mm. who shows that Tantra permits you to get drunk every night and still be a, a, a master. I would say that's not what's what we're seeing there. You know, was was there another question that that I forgot back there a bit? No, or, I mean, okay. perhaps not. Perhaps I'm just kind of trying to kind of get a, a clearer grasp on. The ideas oh, of yeah. tantra for people that that are you know that are they're yeah. kind of interested in playing with it and where we, you know maybe you could just say where 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 they might start to look and and is it related I mean side but kind of like sidelining into to hatha yoga which is essentially our our interest on this podcast does it relate to that at all you know does yeah. it have similar roots and, and right this yeah. is yeah this is a big big topic but um, when trying pedagogically when trying to help people understand any large and complex topic you're considering well, mm. what's the best entry point uh to start unpacking it and so the best entry point is not comparing uh, uh classical tantra to neo tantra the best entry point is comparing it to tibetan buddhism because tibetan buddhism is for the most part tantric <laughs> that is to say it's based in the tantric scriptures um, the Buddhist versions thereof, because Tantra was a spiritual movement that uh, began in Shaivism, the religion of Shiva, the deity Shiva, uh, and his consort Shakti, and it propagated from Shaivism into Buddhism and Vaishnavism and other religions as well. And so uh, already by the year 600, you had a fully Tantric version of, of Buddhism uh, that flourished in India. And then 
uh, propagated to Tibet uh, a bit later. So Tibet received Buddhism in an already tantric form, as mm. opposed to Burma and Thailand and so on, that they received Buddhism in a pre-tantric form. So Tibet received this tantric version of Buddhism, and um, it became right. in Tibet highly monasticized, meaning it, the, it, mm. it existed in the domain of the monasteries. Um, so it, it's a monastic version of tantric Buddhism, um, which of course means that any teachings on sexuality, for example, are secret teachings, advanced secret teachings only for those who've passed all the levels of initiation and so on. Uh, but <laughs> if people want to know what the classical tantra uh, is, you know, we could say it is in many ways quite similar to Tibetan Buddhism, except remove the, the, the cultural idioms that are uniquely Tibetan, remove the monastic elements, um, because in its original form, Tantra was a non-monastic uh, tradition intended for, literally designed for uh, householders, people like you and I, who have mm. uh, relationships and, and, and uh, careers and houses and so on, right? So that was the or original purpose of um, Tantra as a, as a yogic path, a, a yoga designed for householders, which was a new thing at the time, 1500 years ago. It was a, it was a totally new thing because uh, yoga was exclusively for renunciates, yeah. Yeah. you know, for sannyasis, for, for uh, various sorts of renu renunciates uh, and monks before Tantra. So that's, so that's why, you know, Tantra is also uniquely relevant to people today, because all the way down to the early modern period, it remained the only form of yogic practice that was specifically designed for householders. So you mentioned uh, Hatha Yoga, and I'm just emphasizing the the correct pronunciation there so it's uh, i so rarely hear it <laughs> right sorry but, um no, no. go ahead <laughs> that's uh, that's my bad um let me just ask you quickly is there evidence that it was fully formed within india then it goes out to tibet and then it comes back right there's, there's, so you, there's, there's yeah. clear evidence oh, yes. that it ample, was ample. and why does it do that why does it flourish in tibet and not in india and then come back into india and no, then no, re-influence no, brahmanism in india no. It, it, it's not that it came back. Well, it did come back in the 20th century, <laughs> but but no, it's it's that um, Tantra is existing in India in all these different forms, Shaiva yeah. Tantra, Buddhist Tantra, Vaishnava Tantra, and so on, right? And it it, it, it just so happens that um, it's it's Tantric Buddhism that, that reaches uh, Tibet because Buddhism is proselytizing. It's trying to spread itself. Whereas Shaivism and the others, they're not trying to spread themselves, right? So, so Tantric Buddhism reaches, reaches Tibet, reaches China as well, and mm. reaches Japan in, in, in altered forms, right? And it's part of Shingon Buddhism in, in Japan. And, but um, so then it flourishes in, in, in Tibet, uh, right? While the Muslim invasion is devastating northern India, wiping out Buddhism completely, uh, uh, very much um, impacting every other spiritual and religious tradition in India, but not completely wiping them out. So Shaiva Tantra was, was more grassrootsy than, than its Buddhist equivalent. And so it was, it was able to survive the Muslim conquests and continue in this attenuated form. Okay, so and some of those tantric teachings that were around um, fed into early Hatha Yoga, which was a much simplified practice. Uh, Hatha Yoga is a simplified yoga compared to full fledged tantric yoga. And that makes sense in the new context of Muslim domination, because now there's not the, the, the funding, there's not the, the patronage from the state, um, and there's not the you know, institutional basis for evolving much more complex forms uh, of yoga. So that's part of what's going on there. Um, and, and so all the way down to the present day, 
uh, Tantra in its Shaiva form or Shakta Shaiva form uh, continues in India, but more and more and more attenuated. So it almost didn't survive to the modern period, but it just barely managed. And now we're seeing a revival in the context of globalization where people are like, oh, this is very interesting, right? But as of, let's say, you know, a hundred years ago, um, the tradition had almost died out in its various forms. Um, it, so again, I'm painting with broad strokes here. It already sounds complicated, but it's actually much more complicated than, than that. Is there any precedent to say that modern Hatha yoga is anything to do with the original kind of, say, Buddhist Tantra iterations you might see in the Dattatreya Yoga Shastra or the like of that? Is there, is there, is there any relation to, or is it just, you know, that the 20th century just kind of conjures up a completely new thing? No, no, no. Uh, some, some people think that and some people read Mark Singleton's book, Yoga Body, in that way, and, and they're mm. reading it. They're reading it wrongly, and Mark would say so, that even though modern yoga is a product of globalization, even though the influence from, you know, um, Danish and Swedish uh, gymnastics and calisthenics is very, very strong, and, and British Army calisthenics is there and, and, and all this stuff, it, it is a globalized uh, phenomenon, modern yoga, as practiced today and as practiced for the last uh, 90 years. But it also has very strong um, roots in a, a flourishing Indian tradition of embodiment or, or, or physical culture um, that also almost died out. It almost died out under British rule, but it just it barely managed not to. And so Krishnamacharya and, and uh, his teachers were certainly looking at these texts. They didn't have access to good editions of them, but they were looking at texts like Dattatreya Yoga Shastra and and, and um, but more even more so uh, Shiva Sanhita and mm. Hatha Pradipika and so on. So these texts contain tantric elements, um, and also <laughs> modern yoga, you know, has all these tantric teachings woven into it that people aren't aware are tantric teachings uh, but a couple of examples um mm -hmm. the, the the teaching of the unity of all life or even the unity of all things right this a non-dual teaching that that we're all connected or we're all one in some way or another or that all living beings are inextricably interwoven with each other so the fate of any being affects all other beings in some way um, these are tantric teachings that we see appearing in modern yoga. Uh, we don't find them in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, right? We don't find them in, in non-tantric sources, right? Um, but not only that, the, the teaching, for example, the body is a temple or the body is the temple of God. Explicitly tantric teaching. Again, not at all found in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, where we see almost the opposite idea, actually, a need to reject uh, the physical body in order to, to lose one's attachment to it, right? So in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, when correctly translated, which is rare, uh, you've, you're advised to cultivate disgust towards your own body and the bodies of others. And in Tantra, you're advised to look upon the body as the temple of the divine. So very stark difference there. And modern yoga has the Tantric teaching, <laughs> despite the fact that it cites uh, Patanjali Yoga Sutra um, much more often. So there's this kind of profound um, confusion about about mm, sources. Mm. Why do you think it is? Yeah. Why do you think it is that the Yoga Sutra has become the preeminent text in, uh, you know, in for the for the uh, budding yoga student on the teacher trainings, etc. Yeah. Why is well, it that it's so popular. Uh, this is actually well understood by scholars now, uh, so it's not just my, my opinion, um, because under the British, in the British period in British India, education was controlled by the British. And so every educated Indian was 
British educated, right? Mm. So this was part of colonialism. Colonialism was was a, was an extremely powerful force uh, in the culture, right? Mostly negative. Um, so what that meant was that uh, people weren't studying the tantric sources because they were mixed up with, um, you know, sexuality, sensuality, um, weird magical practices, all sorts of weirdness was going on there that, 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 uh, the British Sanskritists, uh, were not (laughs) keen on, not happy about, right? And, uh, so there's a, there's a whole history to this, right? But, but the, the, person who influenced the development of Sanskrit studies more than anyone and who wrote the Sanskrit dictionary, Sir Monier Williams, he said, oh, these, these tantras, they don't bear thinking about. They're mere manuals of mysticism and superstition. And blah, blah, blah. So anyway, um, <laughs> what we had was a context where for educated Indians, there was a lot of kind of pressure, cultural pressure to focus on sacred texts that had the approval of the colonial masters. So those included the early Vedic hymns. And this is a big reason for the lionization of the Vedas in modern Hinduism, even though uh, people know virtually nothing about them. And also other texts that are clean, right, that don't have any Mm. any weird elements. And so um, Swami Vivekananda in the 1890s, he was uh, looking around for like, "Hmm, what text can I base some of my teaching on that will appeal to Westerners and educated Indians? And he landed on the Yoga Sutra, even though the Yoga Sutra was not studied anymore in India, meaning to say um, there were no native scholars of Patanjalian type yoga uh, left in India. The Yoga Sutra was virtually dead as a text. You know, the last commentary on it had been written centuries before. Um, This is all documented, by the way, in David White's biography of the Yoga Sutra book. Mm. And uh, so, so the reason, interestingly, the reason that Uh, Vivekananda chose to um, comment on the Yoga Sutra was precisely because he could give it a new modern spin and no one would contradict him because no one was really studying that text. So he brought it to the the Westerners and the educated Indians. Oh, look here, here's a wonderful text about meditation and the pristine nature of consciousness when separated from the problematic world of the body um, and, uh, you know, indeed, he was successful in, in sort of rehabilitating the text. Um, and this is at a period when people like Vivekananda, who are appealing to Westerners, were utterly rejecting Hatha Yoga and any kind of uh, physicalist yoga, right? So likewise, um, you know, uh, not long after him, you know, Yogananda would also minimize or sideline or reject uh, physical yoga and so then but then little by little this other stream you know started coming in with people like um kuvalayananda who was krishna macharya's teacher one of his teachers uh kuvalayananda in 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 maharashtra right he was advocating for no no actually we don't need to reject <laughs> the physical body we can take these uh, hatha yoga materials mm. and rehabilitate them too so you have, for example, Krishnamacharya, who originally was only, you know, the founder of modern postural yoga, basically, mm. is only looking at Hatha Yoga texts for a long time. And then little by little starts bringing in the Yoga Sutra because uh, everyone else is talking about it. So only late in the game did he say, oh, yes, this is important, Yoga Sutra. Uh, and then his, his son, Desi Kachar, you know, of course, um, highlights it quite quite a lot. So we have this revivalism concerning the Yoga Sutra for culturally specific reasons and and really all to do with uh, colonialism. So for those people who are interested in this project of decolonizing yoga, then this is all very, very interesting. Um, And so 
if you ask the question, which I think is a very important question, hmm, so what would yoga today have looked like if it hadn't been for colonialism, if it hadn't been for three centuries of, you know, two and a half hmm. centuries of British uh, rule? Um, well, it would have, it would be much more explicitly tantric, right? Because even though the glory days of Tantra were long over by the early modern period, you had um, a lot of tantric themes surviving in, in some of these Hatha Yoga materials, such as Kundalini at the, at, the, at the base of the body rising up, penetrating the chakras. This is a tantric theme, which appears prominently in, in some Hatha Yoga sources uh, later. Um, and just a really, really um, interesting scene, <laughs> circa, let's say, the 1600s, right on the eve of colonialism. Um, I'll just mention one fascinating example. Uh, a teacher of mine published an article called Patanjala Yoga is Nonsense, quoting, <laughs> the title is actually quoting um, a, a, a 17th century indigenous writer who in fact um is is emphasizing sort of tantric sexual practices very explicitly and rejecting these um body denying yogic practices whether from patanjali or from hatha yoga he's 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 arguing against these bodily mortification practices and so on and so uh, he's explicitly saying there in the 1600s, writing in North India, uh, Patanjali and yoga is nonsense. This is not the way. In fact, we want to integrate our sensual and sexual experiences with our, with our uh, spiritual life and experience the highest bliss. You're not going to get the highest bliss from this rejection of the body. So mm. that was very explicitly happening right on the eve of colonialism. And indeed, we know that British um, local rulers oppressed uh, and, and, and persecuted tantric groups that were in, engaging in sexual practices. Um, so it would have been very, very different indeed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's an argument that's coming to the fore more. And um, I have heard it before. Um, I think it's very good to give it more airtime um, because, yeah, the Yoga Sutras doesn't appear to be a particularly helpful practical guideline for the modern yoga practitioner. So uh, what is, you know, what, what texts are and how would that look like in terms of the contextualizing Tantra or the Hatha Yoga practice one is doing? What kind of framework would be more helpful in terms of integrating exactly aims and, and uh and then incentives towards it rather than um, aspiring to uh, follow the yamas and the niyamas more more correctly whatever that means in terms of yes one's hatha yoga practice yes yeah. well first as a as a side note let me say that we, we don't want to um denigrate the yamas and niyamas in fact they also appear in some tantric sources even expanded mm -hmm. lists so in one important tantric source we have 10 yamas and 10 niyamas for 20 total, an expanded list <laughs> of more discipline uh, mm. and more attention to your behavior and what's beneficial and what's not. So those are important in the tradition um, and, and they are considered part of the, the, the foundational groundwork that, that you lay you know, with, as a practitioner. So you can only, um, you're only free to uh, dispense with these um, guidelines that can be seen as moral guidelines later on when you're a more advanced practitioner. Having said that, um, what texts would be more appropriate to center uh, in modern yoga, uh, modern yoga teacher trainings, for example? Um, I would say those scriptural texts that teach yogic practices and are body positive, right? So mm -hmm as opposed to yogic practices aimed at transcending the body, getting out of the body uh, yeah. in various ways, right? So, and we find this, we find exactly this in tantric texts. We find an embodied version of, of yogic practice, a cultivation of the body. Um, why? Because there's different end 
goals envisioned, mm -hmm. right? So in, in uh, Patanjali, the, the end goal envisioned is a complete disentanglement from, from the world of embodiment, from the physical world, a transcendent state of consciousness that becomes permanent, uh, leaving the body in yeah. the material world behind. Mm. And in Tantra, the ultimate goal that's envisioned is called Jivan Mukti, and that's, of course, liberation in the body, liberation while living. Uh, so an, an embodied liberation that requires no rejection of any aspect of human experience, right? Which, of course, doesn't mean that you approve everything equally. It doesn't mean that you celebrate everything. It just mm. doesn't, you're not required to reject or exclude any aspect of, appearance, uh, of experience whatsoever, right? Uh, which has nothing to do with um, a kind of universal approval. Right, well, what happens when you die then in, in Tantra? I mean, you, you know, I mean, it doesn't, it's like a, a working conclusion, but it doesn't offer a full conclusion like the, um, you know, the transcendental idea that you just kind of manage to get out of the cycle of reincarnation. Yes. Well, uh, this is interesting because um, in, in, in Tantric um, teaching, if you become Jivan Mukta, uh, mm. liberated in this very body, in this very life, then you are freed from the cycle of reincarnation. Uh, you, you're, not, it's, you're not part of that anymore. But also, they refuse to say anything about what happens when you die, right? That, hmm. You know, it's that, that, that you, are, you are the infinite, and, and then the body drops, you know, but there's no, certainly it, you can tease out implications from the teachings. The, the implication is clearly there that there's going to be no persistence of anything like individuality when the body drops, um, because individuality has, has been dispelled as an illusion, right? Even, even well, consciousness is seeing through a body the sense of being an individual a separate self is completely obliterated in this condition uh, of jivan mukti and so uh, of course there's not going to be any kind of persistence of individuality uh, of anything like a soul uh, of anything that could reincarnate right so uh, what's even more kind of problematic or confusing is like um the status of reincarnation in light of the 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 fact that a soul is not a separate entity in a non-dual tradition meaning to say if you've got mm -hmm. a dualistic mm -hmm. tradition the soul is a monad it's a unit of consciousness which transmigrates mm -hmm. first it's in this body now it's in a new body right <laughs> but in tantra you don't have that you don't have the notion that a soul is a monad or separate unit of consciousness. In fact, the word soul is used um, uh, sort of metaphorically for a condensation of the one universal consciousness that never ceases to be separate, never even becomes an it, right? So, so this, there's, there's just an illusion of individuality from the fact that, um, to use a better metaphor, if you've got, if you have the ocean, right, uh, a, a bit of the ocean can come into a new configuration. So you can get like a whirlpool in the ocean, like when currents are colliding in a particular way, temporarily you get a whirlpool. And whirlpools can even last quite a long time uh, if the currents feeding them are steady, right? And you could name that whirlpool. Say, there it is. There's the such and such whirlpool. But it's never anything but the ocean. It's never anything but the water of the ocean in a particular pattern. Uh, mm -hmm. right? But it has a locality. It's localized. It's here, not there. Right? Even though the, the water That's moving through the, the yeah. whirlpool, it's endlessly... It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's the, all the water, uh, water of the ocean could feed through that whirlpool eventually. In the same way, then, <laughs> that's what you and I are in our true nature. We're just a, a configuration of the universal consciousness, a localized configuration, but, but with absolute non-separateness in this exact same way as the whirlpool uh, in the ocean. So that, therefore, the soul doesn't even exist as a unit, and therefore, reincarnation is understood in this different sense, uh, rather than a soul transmigrating, it has to do with um, 
the the momentum of a karmic process you know same in uh, tantric buddhism as in as in tantric shaivism different ter terminology used but essentially what's understood is that there's a momentum there's a, a kind of arc <laughs> right to a particular configuration that spills over into a new body mm -hmm. right so a, a matrix of desires and unresolved karmas and mm -hmm. so on um is it ha this whirlpool formation on a deeper level than the physical uh spills mm. over into a new body but that doesn't uh, suggest that there's a separate self um so yeah <laughs> that that how we got onto that that <laughs> no, it was a bit of a tangent but that was a relevant tangent and the first time i heard the whirlpool uh whirlpool um uh, a metaphor so uh, a nice yeah. one i think people enjoy that um did you make that one up is that yours uh, n no, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know who did it. it it's, it, it's one that gets used here and there by non-dual teachers. I think right. I might okay. have refined it a bit, but there's nobody laying claim to it. <laughs> it's <laughs> well, it's such market. a perfect oh, metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a good one. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, the, just thinking, you know, to kind of wrap this up as we, as we head into the closure of our interview, I mean, how would the Tantra then like, uh, you know, ref better contextualize and and kind of basically aid people in their own hatha yoga practices because um, you know many many people practice asana practices every day they don't seem to have clear aims and objectives about them what they're doing what they're meant to experience what the goal is basically i mean you mentioned you know in one of your interviews uh basically that you're a seeker of truth um now that seems a little bit uh you know of a kind of um a naive uh, uh, thing for people to think these days that they're looking for truth, right? You know, like how often do you actually hear someone say that these days, right? So, so mm. how you know, like, could you kind of overview like how one might integrate some of these ideas into what one's doing on a yoga mat? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and in answering this, I also want to touch on the bit we left unanswered from before. This bit about which scriptures would be mm, more exactly. more more yeah, appropriately yeah. centered in a modern yoga practice and i just want to give one example which also touches on this this new question um in the vatulanatha sutras for example which is a tantric text um of only 13 sutras so much much more digestible than patanjali's 193 sutras <laughs> right but um in this text we have this fascinating teaching on three primary centers of the body which when experienced in their fullness release three kinds of sublime experience called nectars so these mm. nectarian experiences are possible through going deeper into these three primary centers of the body one being the muladhara region referring there not to just a chakra but but the whole region of the body from the pelvic floor to the low belly right the the core of the body in that in that region um and we're invited we're invited to explore that and how it relates to the formless ground of being and how it relates mm -hmm. to the un underlying uh, most fundamental vibration of reality uh, called the mahanada the great resonance uh, the, and and so there's more detail to that teaching and then we're invited to focus on the heart and what's interesting in this text is the female body is seen as the default practitioner which you never get <laughs> in hatha really yoga sources or yeah. non mm. sources yeah so in this particular text or in this teaching the the female body is the default and it talks about the breasts and the milk in the breasts as a metaphor for the nourishing quality of consciousness that we access by going deeper and deeper into the heart space deeper than the emotions into the sacred heart and that 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 it and it's very lots of kind of explicit somatic metaphors are, are being put into play and that through interiorizing awareness in the body is part of how we're doing this meditative process um and then the third center uh being in the head uh and and so there's a there's a whole teaching on that which I don't I don't have time to get into but the but the but the resolving power of consciousness located in the head is to be meditated upon. And so um 
this this whole beautiful teaching that that invites this exploration of the inner world somatically and subtly and energetically and this is what um could make people's practice on the mat more meaningful mm. is that they're entraining more and more the the subtle body the energy body and even deeper levels within themselves um and 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 their interiorizing awareness not just in terms of the of the tissues of the body and the muscles and the connective tissue and so on but in terms of the subtle energetic uh, reality that's getting um touched into when we uh, actually do some of these poses if we allow for it right because there's a way of doing the poses mechanistically there's a way of doing the poses almost dis in a dissociated manner dissociative manner uh that doesn't touch into the the subtle body so if there's this mm. willingness to access our emotional reality our emotional world and our and and uh the world of the samskaras the unresolved experiences from the past if there's willingness for that then we do in the poses in the physical poses we can access some of these unresolved experiences and allow for their resolution and that's another reason that the, these tantric texts uh like the recognition sutras and the vatulanatha sutras are so appropriate for modern practitioners is this huge emphasis on uh, digestion Hmm. On digesting yeah. our experiences. So instead of just transcending the ego, transcending the body, we are to look deeper into the body, find the unresolved experiences and resolve them. So feel the, the pain that was unfelt before and, and allow it to resolve. Feel the joy that was unfelt before and allow it to resolve. Digesting the remnants of incomplete experience from the past this is a big emphasis in these sources. Um, and, and this digestion allows you to be more embodied and more alive. So mm. Tantra talks about burning the samskaras and Tantra talks about digesting the samskaras, assimilating the, the energy locked up in unresolved experiences and judged parts of ourselves and thereby becoming whole uh, within the body. So that's that's an opportunity that's there and that's so often missed you know so i would love it if modern yoga teachers would encourage their students hey when you feel emotions you know coming up take a moment and and be with that you don't need to move on to the next pose when i cue it you know we don't need to have everyone doing the same thing all the time because sometimes something's coming up and you need to to be with it and totally um give yourself to that experience so it can resolve itself you know uh that's just one little example of how we mm. can make the yoga classes more um helpful to the to the spiritual goal of true holistic experience where we become not partitioned no, no longer internally divided most people experience oh one part of me wants this one part of me wants that i'm torn all the time you know the goal if you want to articulate the goal of yoga from a tantric point of view it is to be internally undivided and then be undivided from the world no more artificial divisions a total holism an embodied holism that yoga can help make happen and that many people are are sort of missing that uh golden opportunity in, in mm. i mean it's very interesting and again in the context of the ideas of modern trauma informed yoga that um that there is actually this uh this ancient precedent for for that which uh yeah it was great and that was a really really good explanation how then i mean obviously you've got many practices that you do personally but how then does the asana practitioner kind of take that what they've done for a little bit of time in the morning or on the yoga mat and take that and kind of contextualize it in their day if they want to if they're serious about you know being a, an aspirant or you know a, a practitioner of a you know a sadhana how would that relate um mainly by uh, uh, dissolving this false separation whereby we have spiritual practice in the morning for an hour and a half or whatever it is including or mm. asana practice whatever 
and then the rest of our day we have you know so this is problematic from a tantric point of view to separate experience in this way so what we would do instead we, you can still have a morning practice of course to to set set the stage for your day to be uh, a bit better more open more relaxed whatever but more importantly that you weave practices throughout your day a little bit here and there so a, a dedicated practitioner um ideally is is willing to say to people hey i you know what i need a moment i'm going to exit this conversation for for a few minutes and go somewhere and get into their body and you know cry some tears or 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 scream some script whatever needs to happen you know because sometimes what's happening now in the present taps into something old which is unresolved and if we push that back down because we got to just get on with what's in front of us or, or the current conversation, we're doing ourselves a disservice, right? So by taking, it can just take 10 minutes of getting into the body, using your training to, to because poses, stretches can help open up something that's locked deep in the body, in the hips or wherever, um, or in the heart. And, and then you know, just let some of that flow. And there's a kind of catharsis that can happen. And I'm oversimplifying the process in the interest of time. Um, and then you return to the conversation, but now you're carrying a little bit less of that burden from the past, which influences how you see the present. Uh, so that's one example. And other forms of micro meditation, where you're dropping in for a few minutes here and there throughout your day, that would be, um, you know, the, the shift that I would call for to allow your, your practice to be more effective and to learn from the wisdom of the tantric tradition, which evolved for, you know, hundreds of years before uh, Muslim conquest and before British conquest, and then got sidelined and, and it's sort of almost deleted from mm. the history. And so that's why we're trying to bring it back because there was this organic evolution that was really getting somewhere and then got and then got cut off. And only now in the modern period, we're getting back to some of this, like this thing of digesting what people are calling trauma is so much a part of the of the tantric tradition, except mm. they say you can do it more quickly than you might realize by um not making a self out of it instead of thinking of yourself as a traumatized person or a wounded person or a victimized person you you dissolve those self images get intimate with the emotional energy itself and allow it to dissolve into the very core of your being into your central channel it's a whole beautiful technique for this but <laughs> this is a way of what they call hatapaka uh sudden digestion or forceful digestion the same word hatha is there from hatha yoga so hatha paka sudden digestion is possible of even very old uh, trauma through this technique and so this is something that we the tradition has to share with uh, some of these mm, people mm. Uh, who are doing this work in the in the modern period and it's it's some really fascinating stuff for those who want a, a, a written reference immediately <laughs> chapter 11 of the recognition sutras my second book um gets into this uh, in, in some detail and then one of the chapters of my new book about to come out also gets into it uh a bit but the the reference that's available for you there now is is chapter 11 recognition All right. um and i also recommend looking at Christopher's uh, YouTube videos and there's a lot of stuff on um, ego and shame and how to deal with uh, different emotions and it's very very good and uh, now I wish that uh, that we spend the whole time talking about that and uh, well he's hard we to get hold of but uh, you can do another yeah, one. I just want to say like people <laughs> if you if you if you enjoyed this with him and you partition um, him or me directly then maybe we can get him on for a second round and we'll talk about uh, but a little bit more practical stuff because he's a lot to say on that and I found it personally very very helpful so uh, thank you and and uh, just to wrap it up Christopher I suppose uh, let's uh, just uh, ask you about your new book uh, what's what's going on with that and uh, you know, just give a brief yes 
I would well, be... it's coming out in just a couple months, and you can pre-order it now. It's called uh, Near Enemies of the Truth. Well, actually, by the time this podcast is up, it's it'll be almost released, maybe. Uh, so it comes out, uh, it's published on November 14th, and it's called Near Enemies of the Truth. Uh, and it is a different sort of book for me, because <laughs> I've done deep dives into tantric philosophy and practice. Um, but this book is aimed at a wider readership, and it's explaining um, why the platitudes and spiritual cliches we hear all over the place are misleading, but what the, the deeper underlying truth uh, that they um, almost point to might be. So p platitudes like um, you create your own reality, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, listen to your heart, uh, follow your bliss, everything happens for the best or everything happens for a reason these and more um the universe is sending me a sign <laughs> there's so many <laughs> so i explore these and i show how they're popular because they're close to a very deep truth that's hard to articulate in words and that but that believing the bumper sticker versions is not ultimately helpful and exploring the more nuanced reality that they almost point to is is much more beneficial. And that's what I try to do in the book, as well as getting into hot topics like what is the ego? Do we need it? Uh, what is non-duality? Um, what's the... Oh, this sounds know, excellent. These, these yeah, sort of things. Yeah. So it's, it's a more accessible book. The language is more accessible. There's almost no Sanskrit. <laughs> it's really uh, good. Yeah. And it's shorter and lighter and easier. Yeah, I mean, I've read some of your more academic papers and uh, yeah, they are definitely for a select market, but that sounds fantastic. And for everyone just to, yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. That's brilliant. Um, yeah. And obviously we'll link in the show notes to uh, website and uh, other information where you can catch uh, Christopher. Um, yeah, just to finish, Christopher, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of on a personal level quite intrigued. So I'm going to ask you my standard questions for podcast guests as they finish the show. Can you give me an inspiration, one, something that inspires you could be a personal place or blah, 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 whatever. And uh, let's say, oh, this is a brilliant one for you. A guilty, a guilty pleasure, because I'm, obviously you can't have any guilty pleasures. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem. Anyway, right? <laughs> these are the two questions I've asked people over a hundred times. Um, so I'm going to ask you the same, and, and then we'll finish. We'll wrap there's, up. Yeah, the, there's uh, the no. Chat today. There, there are no there guilty, no guilty <laughs> pleasures. <laughs> but, um, Brilliant. <laughs> you know, perhaps perhaps people are a little surprised to learn that a, that a spiritual teacher enjoys um, uh, bourbon. <laughs> you know, but in fact, it's so interesting. That's a good one. That's a good one. Because I do I do enjoy uh, bourbon, but. Actually, a, a tantric teacher uh, uh, from Tibet, a, a Tibetan master, wrote a book called The Guru Drinks Bourbon, question mark, which is addressing exactly this issue of like uh, how um, projection onto teachers is dispelled by their, by, in various ways. But anyway, so there's that, um, the inspirational one. Uh, I mean, there's, there, there's so many, there's so many inspirations. Um, you know, I'll, I'll mention um, Rupert Spira, I think is a, is a wonderful teacher who's popular today. And I'd heard his videos on YouTube a bit and I thought, oh, this guy's talking about truth yeah yeah he he's been on like... the podcast yeah okay yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. but but i didn't know how deep he went i just heard some some stuff on youtube and i and i thought yeah yeah this is this is uh talking about the same stuff i talk about but then i heard um some meditations that he gave on on retreat i think that are not on youtube long form meditations like an hour each uh, or longer and I was blown away, like that, hmm. this, because this guy has such an intimate, embodied understanding and, and experience of non-duality, and can transmit it. Um, and so, so when I discovered that not long ago, um, that became an inspiration for me. Uh, just a beautiful way of languaging the the total undividedness of experience, uh, and pointing to the fact that everyone's already experiencing non-duality. They just don't 
realize mm. that they are and yeah. see it needs yeah. to be pointed out. And so I'm glad to say I, I reached out and got in touch with him. And he said, oh, I love your book, The Recognition Sutras. I feel like we're already old friends. And and so made a new connection there. And, uh, uh, he's, so he's a lovely guy. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. so gentle. I felt like I came across incredibly brash talking to him. I didn't regret that, but he was such a sweet guy. Yeah, yeah. I, I just have to qualify. Bourbon, by bourbon, you mean American whiskey, not proper whiskey. Is that what you're saying? You don't, you, you're saying you prefer you prefer Jack Daniels to like Glen Fiddick or, or no, no, you know, no, like no, proper no. whiskey. Good. No, I'm, no, I've got to no, clarify no, that. Right. No, okay. I hate Jack got, Daniels because that's good, not a well made. Good, right. We call whiskey whiskey, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, yes. We're not talking so, about any oh, blended oh, thing from US. A single malt, yeah. a single malt yeah. scotch, okay. Okay. aged for twelve years. If it's um, you know, I don't like the peaty kind to be honest. But also, I love um, American bourbon that's that's properly made, unlike Jack Daniels. So uh, you know that it's a, it's a delicious. It's a delicious thing. But uh, anyway, we can talk about that more uh, in person on the next, on the next um, session. Yeah, we'll start. Yeah, we'll start with that on the on our next session. But uh, you know, it remains to it remains to be said. Uh, thank you very much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. A fantastic interview, and uh, I really do hope that people will uh, request another session so I get to talk to Christopher again. Uh, please get his book. I'm I'm certainly going to get it. And uh, links in the notes below. Whatever. Thank you, Christopher. Appreciate thank you. It. Thank you.